Good evening and welcome to the July 29th, 2013 Goffstown Board of Selectmen's meeting. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, our first order of business this evening is the acceptance and correction of the minutes of the July 22nd, 2013 minutes. Move to accept. A motion to accept. And a second. Second. And a second. Any discussion, corrections, deletions? Seeing none. Okay, all those in favor of accepting the minutes as posted, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5 0 0. I abstain. I think he I'm, I'm not abstention yet, but thank okay. you. 401. Thank you. Um, um, I don't have any published notices, public notices, or announcements. Does Do any other board members have any public announcements they'd like to share? Okay. All righty. A little early for public comments, so go, we'll go right into the town administrator's report. Thank you, Mr. Sue. Chairman. Your weekly meeting schedule <coughs> is in your packets. Tuesday at 4, Sewer Commission at DPW. Tuesday at 6 is the Plant Penardville at Town Hall. Wednesday at 6 is the CMAC at Gostown High School Auditorium. And Thursday is CIP at Town Hall. Hey, I have the Sewer Commission and CMAC covered. Are the other ones covered? Yep. But I will say CIP. You covered? Okay, thank you. Your consensus folder tonight includes manifest. <coughs> General Fund AP warrant is $242,000. $69.60. Payroll and withholding is $147,109.20. Your cable revolving fund AP is $621 and payroll withholding is $1,227.25. Special detail AP is $495.24 and payroll withholding is $2,304.15. Motion is needed to accept the consent. Motion to accept. <coughs> second. second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0-0. Zero, zero. Thank you. Okay. And tonight you have a road tracking form for a building permit on Class 6 road. <coughs> in accordance with RSA 67441, the Planning Board has reviewed the building permit application and offered no comment. Any building permit for building on a Class 6 road requires authorization from the Board of Selectmen. This applicant seeks to change the existing single-family home to a two-family home at 4 McFarland Road, which is at the corner of Mountain Base Road and McFarland. The ZBA has issued a variance for this conversion, as this lot is 0.5 acres with 100 feet frontage in, in the ag zone. Any authorization uh, should be contingent on an approved septic system design. There is backup material at 4C in your packets. Okay, and then we have a recommended action, which is <coughs> to sign a waiver of municipal liability for Class 6 highway building permit agreement and release and authorize the building inspector to issue a permit to convert the single family house into a two family structure subject to two conditions. Number one, prior to issuance of a building permit, the applicant produce evidence that notice of the limits of municipal municipality and liability has been recorded in the Hillsborough County Registry of Deeds in accordance with RSA 674 colon 41 C3 and condition number two is requirement that all building improvements meet the town of Gostown building and fire code requirements. <coughs> is there any comments or? Yes. Um, I have a question. <clears throat> this is converting a single family into a two family in that neighborhood and I know the neighborhood fairly well. And I don't think there's any other two-family homes in the area. Yeah, I know you are very well, too. I don't believe there's any other. So I guess the concern that I have is the precedent that this is setting. I mean, I understand that this is the beginning of the road, but the <coughs> access is on the Class 6. Um, what do we do with somebody else further down that road or another road wants to convert a single family to a, to a m more than one family? I mean, you're, you're increasing the units on the Class 6 road. I guess that's a concern that I have, setting the precedent for that. 
How many dwellings in total are there? Does anybody know exactly? On the crown? Not very many. I know the road, yeah. I don't know. Maybe four, five, six, maybe? Yeah, I'd probably say six at, at most. Yeah. And they're all single families. Next question. Uh, is that a planning board? That was a ZBA issue. <coughs> I know it was a ZBA issued the, the variance, but, and then the planning board reviewed this and had no comment. Right. But would that be more of a planning board function, looking at whether it's two families in that area, one family? <coughs> Just as a question, or is that something? I mean, I understand I where our role. Ordinance issue? I, I'm not sure that's within. I think that's your point. Right. I, I know we're concerned with the liability and the services that we provide in that, but I'm just wondering if that's something we should be considering. I guess if we disagreed with the ZBA's opinion, you had, what, 10 days to, to um, 30, appeal to the ZBA if you felt that their decision was not in accordance with the ordinance or there were mm -hmm. good reasons to deny that variance. Yes. Well, I, I guess the concern that I have is each board looks at different aspects of this. Mm -hmm. The CBA looks at it from granting a variance because it doesn't meet the requirements. They're not looking at it from precedent setting. I don't think that's what they can look at, whether it's precedent setting for that's the true. issue. I think neither does the planning board. The planning board looks at the zoning. And I agree, in the zoning, it's legal. You can have, it's in the ag zone, but where the Board of Selectmen comes in is the final granting of it. And I guess the concern, though, that I have, it's not a zoning issue. It's a precedent that we're setting. Conversion, first of all, why is it required by statute for the Board of Selectmen to sign the building permits, to approve the building permits on a Class 6 road? Why do we have that authority? Because there's no liability. town services and liability. Well, yeah. We're not looking at it from the zoning perspective. We're looking at it from the services and the liability issue. The, issue, the, the, it, the difficulty with Class 6 roads is getting fire apparatus down there getting the ambulance down there. If you have an existing structure and the owner wants to improve it, that's one thing. But when you're converting it to a two-family, <coughs> the precedent that we're setting is the next person comes down, goes to the ZBA, the ZBA already granted one on the corner. Why wouldn't the ZBA grant the second one? or anybody else that's on a Class 6 road and wants to convert a single family into a two family. And, and you're correct, you know, it has been in the past, previous boards have looked at that and granted um, authorized A because it's like the first house in on a Class 6 road, not the expansion. I think this is the first time we've asked for, for an expansion to a two-family. That's family. my concern. We've had, you know, additional bedroom or whatever. Uh, and a deck. Yeah, and a deck. And those had been approved by previous boards based upon their proximity to a Class 5 road. Yes, Alan? Just because they're on a Class 6 road now, they're, gonna, they're still going to receive the same service. If the ambulance has to go, they're going to go. Correct, if you have a fire, they're going to go. I mean... The difference between them being on the Class 6 road as a duplex and being on the Class 6 road as a single family, you're still getting the same services offered and brought to them, correct? I mean, if fire, police, ambulance, they're paying taxes, they're going to receive that call. As long as they can get through. In the past, uh, it's I agree. happened. I agree. I understand what you're saying, but I mean, you know, they're a taxpayer. They're allowed to, I, I would, you know, they've got to be allowed some leeway, too. I, I don't disagree with yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. I don't disagree. The only point I'm making is I have a concern about the precedent. Knowing and, and seeing a house burn <coughs> down to the ground because a fire truck, and, and I think, Mark, you, I think you were there at that. You might have been at that call. Mm -hmm. You couldn't get there. Now if you have 
instead of single family homes, now you got two family homes. You got twice the amount, you got more people there. Well, I can't use that as a, as a, you know, as a reason because I saw a house burn flat with fire trucks sitting in the door yet. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm just bringing it up either way. Would your current <laughs> concern be relieved uh, somewhat by stating that it is on the corner and on the corner of a class five road and therefore you don't, you know, services are. That, that, that's a comment I was going to make. I mean, I think we need to look at these on a case by case basis. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not really concerned about precedent setting because I think we do look at them on a case by case basis. And I do think that it is mitigated by the fact that it is on the corner of a class five road. It's not down the end, you know, mm -hmm. 500 or 1,000 feet or whatever. It's in close proximity to the class five road. Um, so I think that sort of alleviates some of my personal concerns. Uh, and again, I hear the term precedent setting a lot in the work that I do, and I don't really tend to, you know, knuckle under to precedent setting again because I think it's on a case by case basis. So, right. so as I read this, it says any authorization should be contingent on approval of a septic design. I mean, we can sit here and debate this all night and go back and forth. Let's see what the septic system design comes back with, and then I think we should just table this for now and move on and, and see what the septic system design, if, it, if the land, you know, does the perk test and does everything that it needs to do. I mean, all valid points, no doubt. I, I, I strongly agree with everybody. We all have some very valid points here. Um, I mean... That septic system design was in addition to the conditions that in Bryant. And I, and I understand what you're saying, Mark, but I'd soon deal with it tonight, subject to that additional condition that okay. you, they must secure and approve septic right. system design. Yeah, but, but we can sit here and debate it all yeah. night. What happens if they don't? What happens if they don't get the, the septic design? Well, I mean, then our, our motion or, or action would be null and void, okay. unless they get one. Yeah, and just yeah, I, I'm the only reason I'm bringing it up is so there's a discussion and it's in the record. Okay. Yes. okay? Mm -hmm. Because the concern I have about the precedent setting is why did we gr why did we grant it? And as long as it's specifically stated in the minutes, because this was on a corner one, so that now if somebody comes in down the end, at least somebody comes back and they review That's the right. minutes, they'll see that was that discussion. So yep. then I'm fine with. And the minutes will reflect that. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Do we have a motion? I'm sorry, so I forgot. Do we have a motion no. and a second on this already? No. No, okay, so we, need, do, we, need, we do need a motion. Yeah. I want a motion to accept this on the conditions that we have an approved septic system design. That's what it reads on the bottom line here anyway. Yeah, and the municipal waiver of liability and meeting uh, and also the other conditions of Brian's memo. Right. right, the other two, so it's yeah. sort of be three conditions. So it'd be three, yeah. Three, another three, I'll make that motion. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Is there any further discussion? In favor of motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries five zero zero. Thank you. Thank you. Next one is reverse nine one one with the state of New Hampshire. The New Hampshire Department of Safety is offering municipalities reverse 911 for emergency purposes, urgent messages only, they stressed. Uh, state law allows you to notify every wired phone, but prohibits pro broadcasting a mass message to every cell phone in a given area. People must opt into the system. A set <coughs> of policies have been established, which are enclosed in your packet at tab 4D. There is no cost to the municipality to participate. Our emergency management director and deputy are in favor of participating in the state of New Hampshire reverse 91 and recommend that you vote to participate and list local contacts as the two top positions in the police department and fire department. So we are looking for a motion. I have a question. Yes. Like a definition or an explanation or reverse 911, does that mean 119? No. <laughs> well, with people on TV. You know. <coughs> For those who are unaware of reverse uh, 911, it's 911 calls you if you opt into the system in the event of some kind of uh, emergency. So you would be receiving a call, like if the dam broke or something, you're down from the dam, you would receive that notification. But this is only on landline. Right. And in emergency situations, this right. is not correct. The, the software allows <coughs> the community to uh, pull a section of a street, 
call everyone on that street or <coughs> draw a circle around an incident area, <coughs> grab a geographic area, and it will call all of those people with the message that you record. What happens in Penarza? If you were to identify that area, what it, it goes by the major phone carriers landline database. Um, and it's geocoded, so as long as you identify on their map, on the software map, it will call those households. And is there a chance that Orchard Avenue in Manchester will get called if there's an incident on Orchard Street? Because it's in Manchester. I can't answer that. Okay. I don't know. They offered to come down and do a demo for you if you wanted. I, would, I, I don't know if you were to put in an address. If you were to identify it on the map, it wouldn't. That obviously would not um, conflict. I, I think it's important to note that people opt into this. It's not a mandatory right. Uh, right. procedure or compliance. You can opt, you have to opt into it. And it's all, I think it's also important to note there's no cost to, to the town of Goss right. now to participate in the program. Yes. Mr. Right. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to accept the reverse 911 with the state of New Hampshire. Thank you. We have a second. second. We have a second. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 500. Thank you. So it's 617 right now. I want to stop just for a moment and see if there's anyone from the public who would like to comment. If you do, you're welcome to step forward. If you're here for public comment, no, you're here for something different? Uh, we're here on the uh, uh, recommendations from the Safety Committee. Okay. We're, we're going to get to that later in the agenda. Anyone from the public who wants to step forward and address the board? Now is the opportunity. All right, seeing none, uh, we'll move on Thank to you, changes. changes analysis report. As a result of recent town flyovers, properties which have had construction work performed since the 2006 flyover uh, are being identified in a change use analysis report. Our current procedure is that the assessor reviews these pr properties and compares it to the vision database, that's our appraisal database which lists building permits. If a building permit is listed in vision, then the project was completed as evidenced by a certificate of occupancy, then there's no issue. However, if no building permit is listed in vision, then we provide it to the building secretary to determine whether or not it's in the building folder. If there is, n so if it's there, then there's no issue. However, if there is no building permit, and it shows a definite expansion of the footprint, then, um, the building inspector will send out a letter, the first letter to the property owner, um, mandating an after-the-fact building permit and the fee for that. The property owner is given 30 days to comply. If there's no compliance, a second letter is sent out and copied to the prosecutor providing an additional 30 days. If no compliance, then the town prepares a court action. Staff will be starting that process um, after the summer months in the fall for this fall project to be looking at um, that change use analysis report, but we wanted you to be aware of it in case a constituent receives a letter and you'll know our process that we use to get there. So this starts by examining aerial photography? Yes. And footprints of buildings? Mm -hmm. um, they, they identify what they believe to be buildings that have expanded or changed um, and have not been issued a permit. Is there any groundwork done to ground truth the, the aerial flyover to make sure it's accurate and you know when there's a lot of times you can't accurately oh, see they buildings. go out to the field they right the, the first field thing the building inspector does after when he gets the yeah. notice that the um, there appears to be a an expansion okay. he'll get the notice and he'll do a drive-by okay there are other questions from board members on this matter uh, the next item that I thought you should be aware of is the implementation of the Bureau of Securities Regulation decision. Enclosed at your packet at 4F, you have a letter from LGC regarding the BSR decision and the amount which will be returned to the town of Gosstown, which is $168,303.84, unless other litigation impacts the amount before the checks are mailed. As you probably are aware, the hearing officer's decision was to to refund the money to those communities who were members at the time of the hearing officer's decision. There were about a dozen communities who had left just prior to that. 
and they have litigation going on right now because they feel that they added to that surplus over the years and deserve part of that surplus. So I don't know if that decision will be made prior to, but the deadline in the hearing officer's decision was the end of August, so they have to send the checks out by the end of August. But I'm told that if we get a check for that amount, that it is ours and that they won't be looking for refunds. That was news to me. Have you heard anything on that front? No, but I just have a concern. This check goes out and then there's a decision and then we may have to give money back. Mm. And they told us we didn't, wouldn't have to. But it but could be changed if there's a decision. LDC. <laughs> Might be wise to hold the money. Yeah, I think we're going to put a liability <laughs> fund. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it there. Yeah. Definitely. Um, also, FYI, compilation of the EDC documents you requested. I sent an email out last week. Um, we have a listing of all the documents. If you can think of any other documents, uh, let me know. But this is what we found to date, and it's on all those documents are on your Selectman driving scooter. Also, part two of the New Hampshire Dread presentation has been scheduled for August 12th at 7 o'clock. Um, we have re-invited uh, Economic Development Council, Gosto Industrial Corp, Gosto Main Street, Sewer Commission, and the Water Precinct. And the county. And the county, yes. Okay, so Excellent. Yes, um, actually Dan Reedy was here representing a little oh, bit. Right. So um, I, Carol Holden, who was our commissioner, was at, uh, away at a conference out of state. So she wasn't here at the last one. She said she hopes she can make this one. Right. So we decided that one, since you were away, when we had the next one, it was going to be, be bigger. That's all I have for you. All right. We do have scheduled for 6.30. Chief Sullivan to talk to us about the Highway Safety Committee recommendations. We're a little early for that. <coughs> um, why don't you come on up, Chief? I suspect <coughs> you're here for the ones that didn't get recommended, I'm guessing. Nope. No. no. Okay. No, nope, we're here in support of one that did. Okay. Just in case it <laughs> <laughs> okay. serves the board Good for, for you. us to comment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, sure, come on up. A friendly crowd. <laughs> <laughs> What's friendly, that? Friendly crowd? No. <laughs> well, good evening, Chief. How are you tonight? Good, thank you. Just to let you know, we had a kind of informal discussion about what gets put into the packets earlier this evening because most of this packet is the backup data and information for, for these actions. Okay. I think in the future we're going to limit it to the recommendation. That all the information will still be available to us. The We're going to put it on a computer for our Fine by me. Yeah. <laughs> Less paper. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you still submit the same. Oh, we will. Right. And yeah. So It'll be there. It it's available to us. It'll just reduce paper in our Chief, Just as a, while we're on the subject, could you just provide this prior to the highway traffic safety meeting? The whole package to the committee? To the, or, or at least here, so I could review it, or whoever the rep is to highway get traffic. Get it out to the committee. Safety. That's perfect. Okay. Alrighty, take it away. If we can take it a little out of order, is that okay with you? I'm fine. Okay. okay. How would we want to do it? Yeah. We'll do car court first. Yep. <laughs> um, there was a request for a no parking sign at Mountain Road between South Mast and Knoll Crest. Um, after some discussion, a uh, traffic survey was conducted by the police department. Um, the committee recommended a no standing stopping or parking on the west side of Mountain Road between South Mass and Old Crest. That will free up their driveways and uh, allow uh, easy access both to Mountain Road and to their, uh, their, their property. And that's what you're here for? You folks are here? Are you live on Car Court? Yes, sir. Okay. And you're here in support of the recommendation, I assume? Yes. Okay. It'd be a little too odd if we were against it. <laughs> <laughs> We appreciate you showing up, though. Are, are there any questions or comments from the board on, on this recommendation? Um, 
take them. Let's, why don't we do them all at once? Is that okay? Yeah, can we take one motion on all of them? No, let's do, do this one separate. This one requires an ordinance. This one, yeah, Ooh, we'll have yeah. to draw up an ordinance. Okay, yes. Okay, so yeah, why don't we do that? If uh, members of the board members have any questions of the chief, then I'll make, a, I'll make a motion to accept the Highway Safety Committee's recommendation um, for uh, no parking sign on Mountain Road between South Mast and Old Crest and on the west side. Could we have a no standing stopping of parking? Yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm reading from the top. That's why. That's okay. That's okay. I'll I'll just leave it as their recommendation and go forward with a public hearing. Thank you. Do we have a second on that? Second. Motion? motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries <coughs> five zero zero. <coughs> Excuse me. Next. Okay. We'll head back into order now, I guess. Um, sheets are all hung up. Thank you. We'll get you out of here early. <laughs> <laughs> you can stay. You can stay. Well, he's fine. Yeah. Thanks nice to have a crowd. Thank you very much, Chief. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. There's a request for a um, blind driveway sign um, in the area of 272 Gorham Pond Road. After a traffic survey was conducted, uh, viewing the area, I believe Director Quorum is also uh, familiar with the area and had gone by that day. You know, the board voted for nothing to recommend the placement of a blind driveway sign in the area. That address, 272 Gorham. Any question from board members on that recommendation? Okay, why don't we go to the next one? Next one is for a <coughs> request for a blind person sign at 67 Shirley Hill Road. Um, after a view of the area, it was recommended for nothing uh, <coughs> that we place two blind si person signs on either side of 69 Shirley Hill Road. Question from the board members? Yes. Just a quick question, Chief. At, when we discussed this, we also talked about trying to keep track of those types of signs yes. for future years? Have, have we created anything or is there any I progress on that? I have a spreadsheet of all the signs and hearings that we've had. Once they're placed there, we'll have to work on that with our way to determine when they're there and then maybe follow up in a year or two or every two years. A couple of years. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from board members? All righty. Next one was a request to lower the speed limit from to 25 miles an hour on Tyler Drive. Um, after a view of the traffic survey, um, the area, um, the traffic survey that was completed with the maximum speed being only 31 miles an hour, uh, the committee voted for nothing not to recommend lowering the speed limit to 25 on Tyler Drive. Questions from the board on that recommendation? Seeing none. And the final one, there was a request for a blind driveway sign at 286 Addison Road. Um, after a lengthy discussion concerning the reconfiguration and redesign of Addison Road, uh, this is more of an FYI, the committee decided to table more until the construction is done. There's really no action needed on this one. Okay. That's all I have. I'll make a motion to accept the highway safety committee's recommendation. I'll second that. We have a motion uh, and a second. Is there any further discussion on the recommendations? Seeing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5 0 0. I have one other thing I could bring up, and it came to my attention, um, I believe it was early this morning. Um, we have National Night Out planned for August 6th, and I've got several officers working very diligently on it. However, I inquired, where's the event permit, because I haven't seen it yet, and uh, we didn't have one. Um, we've sent, filed one with Town Hall, I've got all the signatures, um, and it's for August 6th, so we're going to start 
putting it out there and ask the board to review it, if not tonight, next Monday night. And could you just explain what that is? National Night Out is a community awareness, um, and everyone's invited. It's an open house um, throughout the community this year. We'll be holding it at both ends of town simultaneously, one at Station 19 and one at Station 18, and behind here um, in the vacant lot. Um, there'll be um, games and prizes for the kids, interaction with the police officers, touch a truck programs, things of that sort at both ends of town to involve the community, especially in light of all the burglaries and car break-ins we've been having. Oh, terrific. So we'll be able to process the event. Yeah, I'm not going to step. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't uh, get it returned. I'm good. I, I got it right you got it here? Oh. It's here. <laughs> oh. If well, you want. The board it's, wants to take action it's tonight. It's signed. <coughs> uh, I apologize for the late notice, but I assigned someone to go door to door today. Go to door, to door today. today. Yes, I heard. <laughs> well, I'll pass this around for board members who may want to see it. It is signed by all the department heads. We have um, written permission from the, the landlord behind us. Yeah. And then a description of the event. Pass around for someone to set this way. Awesome. That's that. Good yeah. question, fellas. Am I on signs? Um, maybe you know. Um, they rebuilt several roads in town, and the signs have been not been put back up on those, like Mountain Road especially. I was just noticing there's always been signs on those roads on the corners. I, maybe you know. There have been signs there in the past. I, I guess none now. It hasn't been for okay. about two years. And I was just curious to whether they should be, if they're in the program, to put back up or if that's just something that's not been put in. I'd ask that. But you, can ask, you should ask Carl maybe all the time if he can get some idea what's going on there. Yeah, Carl's right back there. We yes, I'll ask Matthews right. and that works. <laughs> I'm fine. Yeah, I'll, I'll look at it, but I mean, sure. Well, yeah, we don't think we need to sign. We just I mean, need all to our department heads have signed. Yes, all yeah. department heads yeah. have signed. If everything okay. seems to be in order. Yep. If it meets the criteria, I'm good. Do you have your insurance? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have pulled, yeah. So, so we need a motion? Yeah, yeah. make a motion to uh, authorize the uh, Na national, night out. Na national night, night out. Night out. Yeah. Yeah. On behalf of the Dawson Police Department. Yeah. Yeah. license for it. Okay, do we have a second on motion? Second. Thank you. Any further discussion on that? Matter. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 500. Zero, zero. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. For the short notice. Yeah. Glad we could deal with it. So reflect on your tip. <laughs> <laughs> Again. <laughs> Carl, we had you on for 7 o'clock. It's early. I mean, we can take you early if you're, you're here. I think I saw Dave somewhere. There he is. Are we waiting for anybody else, or do you want to deal with it now? Or Well, I, I hate to put Greg on the spot, but <coughs> the only one we were waiting for is Greg Backos. <laughs> <laughs> Ready to go up a little early? Okay. Sounds good. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Well, folks, I believe you know, obviously you know, Dave Pierce, but this is Greg Bacos. He works for BHB Engineers, and uh, he's been our project manager on this project since uh, 2011 when we had it started. Um, we're here tonight really to um, get the board, I guess, up to speed on the progress. Uh, I apologize for not really thinking about the change in the, in the board. We were kind of marching along and with Selectman Pierce serving on the committee and attending all the meetings. I didn't really think about the fact that, geez, now that Mr. Pierce isn't on the board anymore, I probably ought to go in and <laughs> give everybody an update. Um, so with that, I know the board has had a lot of questions. Um, we provided a copy of um, BHB's run through the, uh, the alternatives. And I know uh, there was some questions about tunnels and bridges and some of the other alternatives that would avoid um, stopping traffic on Route 114. And, you know, I, as you, I, I hope you saw in here, um, that was looked at, kind of a cursory look through uh, the experience of everybody to meet, I guess what it boils down to is to do that sort of thing and meet ADA requirements. 
it would require a great deal of um, land for ramps and, and or going down in tunnels. Our right of way is quite limited, um, so whether you're going down or up, you know, there's sloping requirements or very expensive walls. Um, and I think in the collective experience of DOT and BHB, when we were doing that analysis, um, it would be somewhere in the order of about a million bucks a crossing. That's quite a lot larger than the amount of grant money that we had to work with. So um, we didn't spend a great deal of time on it, um, but it was addressed in the, in the comments. I guess just to, <coughs> to walk through the history of the project, um, you know, back when we applied for the grant, um, we, we had talked about a set of signals that would stop traffic. Uh, the board actually took a vote and said, we really don't like that idea. Um, so we kind of went forward with a concept that was going to just put warning lights that would alert motorists that they're coming to a, a crosswalk area. And, you know, that's kind of how VHB went through the study. That was probably the alternative everybody was leaning towards. And what happened with us was when we got in there, and, and I'll let um, Greg speak more to the data, but when we got into DOT with our draft report, you know, the process is we, we, we do the legwork, come up with a report, submit it to DOT for kind of their first cut comments, then we finalize that engineering report. That sets the basis for moving then into the formal design. Um, we <coughs> finished that preliminary report and submitted it and got a call from DOT and they asked us to come in and have a sit down chat because the folks in the safety side of DOT, the guys that do the traffic lights and crosswalks, had a bit of a difference of opinion from you know, the right of way guys and the, the folks that manage, manage the, uh, the highways. So we all kind of got together in the, in the conference room at DOT and talked through the problem. And essentially, DOT um, kind of reached a recommendation to us, and VHB, I think, concurred because in their experience it was, it was uh, worrisome as well to have as much traffic as we had on 114 and potential conflicts with uh, children and bicyclists crossing 114. That's the same concern DOT had. So the recommendation for us to go back and look at um, what's called the Hawk signals um, was made. So we did that. <laughs> the difference between a Hawk signal and a flashing yellow beacon, and you folks just had highway safety recommendations in front of you, so this is a great time to have this little discussion. But when you have a constant flashing light that's there all the time, it blends into the background, and anybody that drives through the corridor all the time is not going to even notice it. Um, the difference with the Hawk signal is in the early years when the, when the trail is just getting, people are learning about it, they're starting to use it, the users are not as uh, numerous as they hopefully will be in the future, it would be a black signal head all the time unless somebody needed to cross the road and they pushed the button, activating it, at which time it would be something new happening. It wasn't just a constant yellow beacon. There are no hawk uh, crossing yet that I know of in New Hampshire, I don't think. Not that I'm aware of. Um, and mm -hmm. for that reason, DOT uh, was very interested in, this is a good test case, good time to, to employ this technology. It is used elsewhere, but we just don't have it in New Hampshire. Um, VHB went back and did some cost estimating, and it was about $130,000 more um, to do these signals, which obviously became a problem for us immediately. Um, well, I'm sorry, Colin, more than a standard flashing yellow? Than no, more than what we had originally anticipated. So it was going to add 130000 to uh, the project cost. Uh, the project cost. Right. Um, however, DOT uh, was invested enough, I guess, in that that's the safest way to, to handle it, they pitched the idea to their Highway Safety Improvement Committee, is that what HSS is? that's right. Yep. Mm -hmm. they, they have a committee um, and they have what I guess I call discretionary funds where they look at things like problem intersections, high accident counts, um, and they have some money that they can help 
remedy uh, dangerous situations. It's not typical that they would use that money proactively to avoid a situation. Usually it's fixing a, a known problem. Uh, but in this instance, they felt this presented a, enough of a safety concern to them that um, they have told us they would apply the money they would pay for the additional $130,000 if we uh, employed this Hawk system. So that kind of gets us to where we are today. Uh, I know, you know, Sue sent us, um, and the board had their discussion. Sue had sent kind of a summary of what those concerns that the board had discussed were. So I think we were prepared to, to discuss those. Um, the piece that I can tell you is um, how much have we spent to date? Somewhere around 60000 is what we have paid. I'm sure we have some work that BHB has done that has not been billed to us yet, but as far as invoices that we've actually uh, paid out the door, it's, it's somewhere in that range. Um, when I asked uh, DOT the question of if we decide to not go forward, um, what does that mean to the project? Well, I asked two things. One, if we want to go back and take another look at the alternatives, you know, is that possible? One of the problems we have is um, when Congress passed MAP 21, they eliminated TE. So the TE program is no longer funded. Now they have other programs to cover the types of things we're doing. However, TE itself um, sunsets in 2015, which seems like a long ways away, but when you're working on a federal highway design, it takes a long time. So it, it's, it's really not uh, very far away for us to go back to the drawing board and take another look. So then I asked the next logical question, which is, okay, if we decide not to go forward with the Hawks, you know, what does that mean? Would we get reimbursed the money we're into it? And I kind of got a chuckle and a glance and a, uh, <laughs> probably not, but, you know, and I think that is more into the political realm than the technical realm at that point. Uh, but technically, Federal Highway would pull the funding for the project if we weren't going forward. And once again, DOT would be the meat and sandwich holding the bag, and you know what they do about it. I don't, I don't know. They might that. send us a bill, well, like they did once before. The, the, and we have actually gotten some reimbursement from them so far, um, so that we would have potentially a request to pay back money that they have um, reimbursed us on. That would obviously be quite messy. So to that end, I'm hoping we don't get there. I'm hoping that we uh, can talk through the, the hawk signals and answer any concerns and questions that you all might have and see where we go from here. In anticipation of this, uh, looking back through the record, I realized the rail trail folks had never really formally weighed in on this. So they did have a meeting and we talked it through with uh, the rail trail committee and I think I'm, I'm here, to, 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 is here to, to speak to that. So. Um, what I brought with me, and I will pass around while we uh, do the other things, is I did bring a copy of the DOT letter after they reviewed the study. And on the back of that is also uh, a copy of an email that explains the highway safety uh, money to the best that it's been explained so far. So with that, I'll turn it over to Selectman Pearson or Dave Pearson. Dave Pearson, thank you. If I can, Carl, just, just for folks who may be watching on, on GTV, can you explain the locations? Yes, the, I'm sorry. For folks? Um, yes, this, what we're discussing are the, um, the rail trail crossings of 114, one of which is by the ball fields by the Villa Augustina School. Uh, the other one is down by Magoo's or KRG uh, Automotive. They're the two spots where our rail trail crosses with 114. The project also includes the crossing across Henry Bridge Road, but that's, that's really not what we're talking about tonight with Hawk Signals. That's Thank you. Yes. Could I just, Carl, could you just clarify one thing, just so it's clear? When you talked about the yellow flashing lights being on all the time and people getting accustomed to them, would that not activate the same way as the Hawk system? I understand the operation's different as far as cars stopping, but those rapid rectangular flashing beacons would only come on the few times people crossed. Correct. That's correct. So normally yeah. they would be... They'd so just be black. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. so there wouldn't be a um, 
saturation, if you will, of the drivers where they would get used to it because they'd only see it at the same time as they would see. Okay. And I just you know, I guess that. before I turn over the floor, let me just get my little soapbox out. Um, if we ever got to the point where uh, it was a problem, there were so many people using the trail that we had a problem. Uh, at that point, I think you could look at more expensive solutions with more of a straight face and say, okay, we now have a very successful trail uh, and we need to do something about it. Um, I had come into the board back in 2011. At the time, I was using the Minuteman Trail almost mm -hmm. weekly, daily. 20,000 cars a day going into Hamskin Air Force or Space. Thousands of people using the Minuteman Trail. and. Uh, I didn't experience any negative either as a driver uh, or as a bicyclist. People just adapt. Um, this is very similar to the intersection discussions we have when we're talking about roundabouts is we're trying to give the side people a break in the steady traffic to give them a chance to get across there. And it's quick. It's only when it's needed. Uh, and there is also that I did confirm there is that feature you can program it so that uh, if somebody pushes it and you don't want to have you know somebody pushing it every minute or it's like you can program a delay so that it mm -hmm. only can activate once every once every eight minutes yeah. once it, whatever whatever it is but so kids couldn't just sit there and ha ha ha, ha all day long so. as, I, as I understand the negative aspect of the flashing yellow lights is flashing all the time drivers say oh yeah I'm coming up that yellow flash and I hear it yeah. again big deal yeah. Keep right on trucking through. Right. It's Nick, did, yeah. could, Nick, did you? Which is quick. Could you just set the stage? What is our pedestrian per hour count on the trail? We don't know yet. Yeah, um, the trail is still really in the beginning stages, and because of the locations of these crossings, the one at the ball field is the one that's really hard to predict because that's very peaky. You know, when there's a game or a Saturday morning or that sort of thing. Um, you should know that the bridge um, into Gosstown from Manchester over the Piscataquag is going to be completed uh, early next year. So we expect to see a rise in the trail usage in Gosstown as a result of Three. being able to go off-road the entire way into the city. So right now I'd say it's, it's pretty low, but it, I can see it increasing over time. Yes. Just as a follow-up, there, are there any plans to do – I mean, I've read various studies around the country on trails, and they typically – set up a video camera and they video for 24 hours, count the, um, mm -hmm. I mean, do we have any idea how many people? I mean, it, I'll, uh, Dave Pierce, uh, I'll just offer my, my personal observations. Uh, I am frequently on the rail trail uh, twice or three times a week uh, doing various maintenance activities, uh, brush clearing. I have Every time I've been out there, I have always seen two to three in individuals or uh, groups of individuals on the trail. Invariably, every time I'll see people. Um, that's encouraging from my perspective because I'm, I'm trying to promote this new recreational and, and commuter corridor for the town. So it's encouraging for me to see that, especially uh, when I see uh, an entire family, mother, father, kids out for an afternoon, or groups of mothers pushing baby carriages midday, taking advantage of the secluded trail and, and the you know, pleasant environment. Uh, so there are people quite frequently using the trail. Have we done, you know, Counts. a head count? Yeah. No. Yeah, I would agree. I use segments of the trail all the time, and I always, every trip, see someone, if not many someones, and it, trail. It, it, just I'd offer if you if you if you wanted to spend 20 minutes doing your own test, just go down by the arena mm. uh, in Manchester. Oh yeah, and watch the traffic on that because that's what's going to come right across the bridge. So all those folks that now can go from the baseball field, you know, out to the arena and back, will now have the opportunity once that bridge is crossed to just keep coming. And when we fix the dip uh, and make the crossings of Mass Road safer. There's a lot of people that can be going back and forth both ways down to the city or, or out. Uh, it's a pretty pleasant Carol, place. Mr. Chairman, I, I have three points that I wanted to present as information to the board uh, before we get into a heavy discussion. And one, I had a, a considerable hand in drafting 
the application for the grant back in 2009. We did not willingly uh, not, uh, put in the design to avoid a stoplight. Our initial call was for a stoplight. Of course, a standard stoplight at mm -hmm. that time, because that's all we knew about. Uh, we did not willingly take that out of our initial concept. There was initial discussions uh, with Mr. Quarum at DOT, and we learned that they weren't going to favorably look at a grant that had uh, a stoplight crossing for a mass road. And so we, we backed it down a tier, and we adopted the uh, rectangular blinking lights as a method of warning drivers that a pedestrian was about to cross the street. And now if you jump forward three years, when the engineering study was submitted uh, to DOT and more people got involved in that analysis, the highway folks, DOT, did a 180 degree turn. And they said, the only way that we can address pedestrian safety is through a method of stopping traffic. And uh, that brings in my, my second point, is that we now have an opportunity for, through a new federal manual standard on traffic lights of the, the Hawk system. And the, the biggest difference, uh, we've, unnest, we've addressed the fact that it's typically always no lights at all, it's black, but uh, the biggest difference is that after a brief period of being solid red in traffic, appropriately stopping, it goes into a blinking red, which as in any other intersection means that a driver can proceed as long as their lane is clear, rather than um, as we've seen in, in some situations where a pedestrian is uh, safely across the street, the driver still has to <coughs> sit there until that light turns solid green. Uh, so that's, that's a good compromise that we now have offered to us through a, a change in the stoplight situation. And uh, my, my third point is that the uh, Rail Trail Committee, whose official charge is to bring you recommendations to the board for your consideration, we did meet on the 19th of July, and I believe you probably have in your read-ahead packets that those, uh, the, the committee made two recommendations to this board. And if it's appropriate, I'll read them into the record. Okay. The committee recommended that the selectmen endorse the design change introduced by the New Hampshire Department of Transportation in their review of the preliminary design for the scope of the rail trail improvements, which are to be accomplished through the 2010 Transportation Enhancement Grant, specifically the installation of high-intensity activated crosswalk, called Hawk, traffic lights for the two mass road crossing sites. And this was uh, passed 7-0. The second recommendation was that the selectmen be, uh, endorse an offer of New Hampshire DOT to provide highway safety improvement program called H, well, HSIP funding to cover the cost of the Hawk Beacon traffic lights, which will be part of the uh, rail trail improvements accomplished through the 2010 Transportation Enhancement Grant. So the, and that passed 7 0. So those were the recommendations that. The committee that you've set up to provide you those those ideas on trail development uh, have brought forward. Thank you. Thank you. The operation of this thing, so it's it's operated by the pedestrian. They push a button just like they would a crosswalk button, mm -hmm. and then you say it doesn't go through a full cycle. It, is it so it does it detect when there's no longer a pedestrian in the crosswalk or how do you avoid the full cycle of a red light like you would with a regular red light? Yeah, if you'd like, I can run through the phases. Yeah, that'd be uh, great. I brought the actual plan that's going to be in the plan set. Uh, we have some preliminary timing that DOT will be reviewing. Um, wish I had a video, but I don't. It's 
There aren't any of these in the state yet. Um, I do need my glasses. <coughs> so the first phase, of course, or the, the constant state is that it's all dark. So drivers uh, won't see uh, an illuminated signal over them. And by the way, there are uh, two heads facing each direction of travel. So there's redundancy in case one, one fails, and there's also better uh, visibility uh, since there are two heads. this is on a mask that, that spans the road on two, by some two. Actually, um, we were originally thinking conventional traffic signal would be one mast arm from each side, but we're able to do it uh, from one side and therefore save significant cost. Um, the road's not very wide, so it was, we were able to do that. Um, <coughs> So then a pedestrian comes along and, and pushes the button. The first thing that happens is it begins flashing yellow. And I can give you the times. It will flash yellow for five seconds. So it's not very long. And then it goes to steady yellow. So it originally flashes and it catches their attention. And then it goes steady yellow, which people are accustomed to seeing before something goes red on a regular uh, traffic signal. So it's steady yellow for another five seconds. Uh, and then it goes steady red um, during the pedestrian walk interval. So it goes uh, to a solid red, which means everybody has to stop for seven seconds, which isn't very long for pedestrian to cross the road. That's the initial red phase. Um, and then, as Dave said, then it begins to flash. It has, and, and so far everything I've talked about um, uh, the, it has not exhibited the flashing mode, really. Uh, so. This, um, this next red phase, two red signals flash, alternating like that. And at that same time, the pedestrians are looking at a countdown timer that tells them how many seconds they have to cross. So um, that gives the pedestrians an additional 12 seconds. So in total, the, the pedestrians have 19 seconds to cross. Um, but as Dave said, if, say a pedestrian has run across or jumped the crossing and just, you know, as you see some people do. Um, once it's in flashing red mode, the motor vehicle has the opportunity to look both ways, and if it's clear, they can go. Um, so in theory, the motor vehicle may only be stopped um, for that um, seven-second walk cycle. In theory, that's the minimum that they would, they would stop, assuming a pedestrian has crossed quickly but it might be as much as the 19 seconds. And then it reverts back uh, to being off. And uh, we were originally timing a reset of half a minute, 30 seconds, before the next pedestrian can push that button. And that can be adjusted, as Carl said, that can be adjusted up. But you risk, if you adjust it up too much, you risk pedestrians getting frustrated and, and jaywalking and trying to shoot across. So there's a, there's a balancing act there. Um, so that's how it functions, and uh, pretty straightforward. There would be signs uh, with instructions telling the pedestrians what they mean. There would be signs for the motorists, such as um, they're going to be stopped back 40 feet from the actual signal. This, there will be a stop line in the road 40 feet back, uh, and then there's a sign right next to it that says stop here for pedestrians. So there's a little bit of education there. There's also a sign up on the mast arm for the motorist that says crosswalk, stop on red ball. Um, so that's pretty clear what that means. Um, then there are also signs for the pedestrians that instruct them what the buttons mean, what the countdown means, and that sort of thing, what the, the, the timer means. Uh, and then there's a big sign for the people using the trail that says uh, bicyclists use pedestrian signal. So the bikes don't come screaming up and just shoot across. They, they're instructed to use the button. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. I'm you know, happy to answer more questions um, if none of that was clear. It sounds like there need to be some public education and outreach relative yeah. to that fact that you can go when it's flashing red as long yep. as it's clear. I think the ultimate education would be the person behind you start talking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, no. stuff up on the website like we did, how yep. do you drive around about? How do you proceed, and, yeah. you proceed through? And there is actually a very good YouTube video, mm -hmm. video yeah. that exactly. shows it in mm -hmm. operation, so it would be easy to provide a link. Ben, this uh, is the first one in New Hampshire, though. I'm sure we can right. get that out on the news, too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. get it on MUR and do yeah, a few. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
Do we have a state law in this state that you can stop pedestrians in crosswalks anyway? Yes. So then why not just put crosswalks in? Do we need to put lights up and we'll go all through it? It's a state law now. If you're on the main street, you have to stop for a person to crosswalk, correct? Right. right. There, yes. There, I, I do want to backtrack about the other levels of improvement. And I guess putting a simple crosswalk with no no signalization at all would be the lowest level of improvement for this intersection. I mean, for now, I'm just looking you know, we're only talking, we don't even know how many people are going to actually cross this crosswalk right now. Yeah. Could be five a day, might be two a day. Could be as many as ten. Right. So do we want to spend that big chunk of money right now, or do we want to wait a while and... Well, let me let me finish the, yeah, the yeah. discussion on the lowest level of improvement. Um, you could put a crosswalk there and some signs that alert motorists that that's where the crosswalk is, except New Hampshire DOT will not allow us to paint a crosswalk in a 40-mile-an-hour zone, which this is. Um, and that we saw originally as one of the big drawbacks of the next level of improvement, which is the rapid flashing beacons. DOT said even with those, you're not allowed to paint the crosswalk. So in my mind, what's the message I'm telling the driver? What's the message I'm telling the pedestrian? I'm telling the driver, well, there's a, some kind of a crossing here, even though it's not striped in the road. So the driver's thinking, well, I don't need to stop. If, if the pedestrian goes out, then certainly I'm not going to hit him but the law is protecting me as the driver. Um, and then the pedestrian with the rapid flashing beacon, say he comes up and pushes the button. To a lot of people and a lot of little kids, they're expecting that now I can cross. But in fact, it's, it's just advisory. When those flashers are going, that's just advisory to the motorists that they don't have to stop until somebody is physically out in the road. Um, so without a painted crosswalk, uh, that's where I had real heartburn, is that we're not really providing any protection to the pedestrians. So this next level, the Hawk system, DOT is allowing a painted crosswalk, and they are stopping vehicles. So in my book, that that's where I can sleep at night, is, is with that system. And then finally, the system that Dave originally talked to D about, DOT about, which is the fourth level of improvement, which is a full traffic signal that is always on in some capacity, either green, yellow, or red. Um, we're not allowed to put those up when you don't have really significant numbers of pedestrians. And, and the book says 100 per hour for four hours straight per day. And we'll never reach that. Uh, we may in really peak periods, but this is a year-round facility. And in the winter and the fall and the shoulder periods, you're never going to reach that 100, out, 100 per hour for four hours straight. So, so that is off the table. And that's why originally DOT said no, I think, to the full traffic signal. Uh, so for them to now allow the Hawk system seems like everybody wins uh, in my book. At one time we played with lowering the speed limit too as that right. was an easy workaround and that didn't get very far either. Yeah, there's <laughs> rules on that. I guess if the, I was going to ask because if the warrant the yep. for the Hawk system is the minimum is 20 per hour right. for four hours, yep. which we don't even come anywhere close to that. And I think for the vehicles per day, at a, if we say a thousand vehicles an hour, yep. you're at about 40 or 50 pedestrians per hour for four hours. So, right. so those are huge numbers for the warrant. Right. For, for the, the warrant. warrant. Correct. So again, I keeping it simple, six tenths of a mile from that proposed crossing, we have a crosswalk. Yes. A traffic signal. No, nope, a crosswalk. Oh, a crosswalk, crosswalk on the other Shur way. Shirley Hill Park. Which probably has ten times the number of pedestrians that cross the street twice a day for over almost ten months a year. High school students. It's a painted crosswalk. The difference is that's a thirty mile an hour zone, forty mile an hour zone. So I, I say I, I understand you said we've explored that, but why couldn't we extend that thirty mile an hour zone six tenths of a mile more? Isn't it outside of the urban compact? It, 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 is. Well, it is, but and there's the RSAs allow us. You, know, you have to do the traffic study. Right. You have to get the DO, the commissioner of transportation to okay it. But if you think of the other potential benefits, you've got the Villa Augustina, which has flashing yellow lights, brings the traffic down to 30 miles an hour twice a day for almost 10 months out of the year. You've got Norman Road, which when we look at intersections like High Street, we say slow the traffic down. That's going to allow people to make that eye can contact it, get out. So we have multiple problems that by 
reducing traffic for six tenths of a mile down to a 30 mile an hour zone, we could then, I would say, change the geometry when you do your parking area, provide some bump outs, do some traffic calming. And again, now you've reduced the length of your crosswalk, mm -hmm. you've increased the visibility of your pedestrians, you've shortened their exposure to crossing, and you could get by with a painted crosswalk because you're at 30 miles an hour. You can use your pedestrian, your rapid rectangular flashers. And you can do the same thing at pro landscape because you're only three tenths of a mile from the intersection. So you could reduce that section to 30. But what I think it does benefit wise is you're slowing traffic down, improving some problems. You're not stopping traffic unless you have that occasional pedestrian and you have the same treatment. Now, as a young child, I come to Henry Bridge, or I go the other way, I come to the villa, I push the button, traffic stops. Keep going, I go to Pro Landscape, I push the button, traffic stops. Now I get to Henry Bridge, and maybe they stop, maybe they don't stop. I mean, I understand cars have to yield to a pedestrian, but we know that doesn't always happen, but that child is thinking, Traffic stopped because it stopped for the other two, mm -hmm. and they're just going out. Um, but I think if you have the same treatments all along, keeping it simple, if in the event we have tremendous increases in pedestrian traffic, then you can always upgrade to a Hawk system later on. Um, but I think this system, being the first in New Hampshire, is going to cause confusion. We're not going to have the usage of it on a daily basis to get drivers comfortable with it. Plus. We can educate everyone in Goffstown, but that's a commuter route. We have huge numbers of people that go back and forth from outside of the town using that. So in my, my personal opinion is I don't want to see traffic stop um, needlessly, particularly in the summertime when you have baseball going on. And <coughs> every three minutes, if that's what your delay is, somebody's crossing because they park on both sides of Mast Road. Mm -hmm to get to those fields. Um, one, one point I would make is um, if you paint the line, it's no different than the red light legally. The minute that same five people steps into that crosswalk, it stops. But as you said, maybe. You know, there's no, the driver may notice the crosswalk, may notice the kid, or maybe they're looking down at their phone or they're doing whatever else they do. So the, the hawk doesn't stop traffic any more often, but it certainly has all the visual, visual cues to, to get somebody's attention. Uh, and when we explored that with DOT, and Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember we had, it was like the 85th percentile requirements, Speed, and right. we just mm -hmm. didn't feel the geometry of the road is such that you could put the sign up all day long, right. but if there's not a cruiser parked right there at the sign, people are going to drive the 40. And, right, because the geometry lends itself to that. Yeah, so that, so they but weren't But I think that's where that the traffic that. calming comes in as well, because we yeah. do those same treatments. When we did the roundabout, that's why we, yeah. we did that for the traffic calming effect, maybe a mile and a half. The difference is this is not the urban compact. The, oh, no, and I understand that. But if, if you're the type of driver, when you see a yellow light, you stop. I mean, you're, you're looking anywhere from 19 seconds to 24 seconds, whereas if you just have to yield for the pedestrian in the crosswalk and it's a bicyclist, three seconds, as soon as they go by, you can start again. So you don't have that 20-second delay. Then when the light starts flashing and you go, will three cars behind you continue to go with you? It, it, I mean, we don't have that experience with it. And I'm, I don't have the warm and fuzzy being the first in the country, first in the state to to put this system up. Bill, say your name. Yeah, um, I have a couple questions. Um, as far as the uh, maintenance of the system and the maintenance of the crosswalk, who's responsible? That'd be us. We are. Yeah. So we're putting them in DOT right away, but the deal was they'd be our our facility. Okay, so, but actually, regardless of what system we have, we have to have a crosswalk, is that correct? 
so regardless we'd have that that expense um, does this have any audible sound does this have any beeping with it as some of the when you when you do the for traffic lights with different areas um, that audible sound it shouldn't but actually when you push the button it probably would for the uh, um, vision impaired individuals mm -hmm. but that's about it otherwise it wouldn't it would be silent okay the final letter that we received uh, uh, the letter addressing the engineering study did address the fact of the uh, tactile pads mm -hmm. uh, on the trail mm -hmm. just prior to the uh, asphalt so it was vision impaired those are for vision impaired right. and mm -hmm. I, I have I have one other question yes, sure. and I don't even know if it could be answered but I'm going to ask if we go forward with this system and issues develop <coughs> how accommodating would DOT be with us to rectify the situation or would they just walk away from this and say off sound is your fault your problem I guess it depends on the issues um, since they had such a important hand on making the decision to go with the system I would imagine that um, and it's, since it's a pilot for them too it's, you know first in state I would imagine they'd be involved with Rectifying, I, I guess and they would want to know how this system works. Yes, I, I would assume. Yep. I mean, I, I read, I read in here, and and I guess what I I thought was important <coughs> was it uh, it talked about uh, this is Marty Callawa. Uh <coughs> Sally Gunn did an excellent job of presenting the case for using HSIP funds pertinent issues discussed are as follows and she goes through with it and one of the things is that it's uh, used in other states but there's but it's new to New Hampshire <coughs> um, with that so just reading that it seems to me that they that that's relevant yes. to, the, to this yep. and I, I I think by not going forward with this if we just revert it to something else um, I, I, I'm fairly comfortable going forward. I mean, I, I had the concern that I had mm -hmm. was I've been involved with CMAC projects <coughs> in the beginning in Bernardville. Oh, yeah. The purpose of CMAC is you don't stop the traffic for congestive mitigation right. for air quality. <laughs> okay, yep. we put roundabouts in for the same reason. Now all of a sudden I'm having this kind of a system in between those two areas, and it's kind of like an oxymoron. Mm. Yet DOT, and I understand DOT has nothing to do with the CMAC grants, so it's a different, you know, Actually, different different people at different people. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, 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 sure. yeah, but it's not like they don't breathe the same air. Yeah. So I, I guess the, my only counter to that is that we're encouraging people uh, to leave their car at home and use the trail, you know, by making it safer. <clears throat> so you're taking some cars off the road just by well, improving the trail. And it's not exactly the same as a vehic vehicular uh, intersection True. with crosswalks. It's right. a different animal. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess once you get past that, you know, idea, that concept that it's different, you know, it's it's I'm I'm okay with it. So that's what was difficult for me. I did ask um, uh, one of our lead traffic engineers who put these plans together um, what was uh, I was curious what the compliance is like in states where they are using it in other words are there any problems with people not recognizing it and just going through or going too early or that sort of thing and he said he has seen studies uh, he mentioned Arizona where the compliance is very high 95 percent according oh, oh. to the federal <clears throat> DOT study there you go you yeah. know Gof Goffstown's, Goffstown's on a cutting edge of a lot of things and we were the first in the state with automated trash collection hmm. you know mm -hmm. I mean we've been on the cutting edge of a lot of issues and, and to me that's no, this is no different they had a reduction of 69 percent in pedestrian accidents wow 
they did a before and after study. And that was the Arizona? Yes. So, yeah. so come over right here. <laughs> <laughs> one, one of the most frightening parts of this for traffic is this is the equivalent of a mid-block crossing. Right. So you know, drivers kind of get it when they're coming to a stop sign or an intersection. They're kind of watching for people crossing. This is mid-block on a state highway away from the urban compact. It's kind of the crosswalk nightmare. Yeah. First time Greg and I talked about it, he's like, you want to do what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nick, you yeah, just a quick question. I'm just looking at the, the documents that the DOT reviewed. One of them was 114 posted speed limit, 40 miles per hour, average daily trips, 18 to 20,000 vehicles per day. And I'm looking at the, the VHB report that says average vehicle per day, 15 to 16,000. And then a pedestrian flow with a peak usage in the near term of 75 to 100 per hour. How did we come up with that number? Projected. I'm not sure. You know, land use and, and I think comparing to uh, similar paths of uh, similar length and uh, land use, we can project that that's how much uh, peak you would get. Yes, sir. I'd like to see some kind of a number that we actually have an actual count of whoever's using this trailer, how many are actually, you know, is it 10 people a day, is it 15 a day, is it, I mean, if we're going to spend that big pile of money on something like this, yes. let's find out how much actual use we're getting out of it, and if we're going to throw this you know, on the table. Because, Mr. Brown, you, you, you know, right now there are, like mentioned, there's a considerable number of people are using the trail if you get out there at any particular hour of the day, or and more on the weekend. This is a trail right now that's only about one fourth of it has been improved to town standards, and yet they're out there enjoying this opportunity. No, I, and, mean, and, I understand and that, but there's no real number. Nobody has an actual number. It's, so it's two, two yeah. things. What is, what is the what is the real number going to do? Yeah. yeah. Well, the seventy-five to hundred per hour is just a number that's just arbitrary oh. thrown out there. So. Well, I do, if I could, it, it does make a, there is a point to it because if our, if our average pedestrian per hour count is well below what the warrant for such a system is and stays that way, why would we be putting in, I mean, we didn't put one in at Henry Bridge because it didn't meet the warrant for vehicles. And it's a low speed road. Understood, yeah. but I mean, we, we followed the the warrant requirements on one road, but not on the other, because we're projecting. I mean, we're, we have a, a CMAC meeting, I think, coming up for Pleasant Street, and in 2006, they predicted higher volumes of traffic and came back and said, you know what, traffic went down, and that's using very scientific vehicular mm -hmm. predictions. We don't even know how many people are on the trail right now. Do we know how many people are on the Manchester Trail? They might know, yeah. We might be yeah. Like that. I mean, that might be a number at least to start That's with. somewhat to relevant. See right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How many will, will come over. You know, and that, I don't know if the board's ever, ever been briefed in on it, but um, the greater Manchester area has a lot of long-term plans. They've got trails going down and connecting to Derry and London Derry and down to Merrimack. You know, the city is like the center of the spokes. And then it, in all directions, out the hooks it, there are trails. There's already, my wife and I went on a nice ride Saturday uh, from Lake Massabesic. You can ride all the way to Newfields on a trail that parallels 101. It was fabulous, 24 miles. Uh, that, when Manchester finishes their inner city connection, Gosstown folks yeah. be able to jump on here mm -hmm. all the way to Newfields or Exeter. Uh, is it in the near future? Probably not. That's a lot of money. And every time you try to make a trail improvement, everybody says, well, how many people are out there today? <laughs> well, <laughs> nobody. It's not safe. Uh, once it's safe, more people are going to use it. Once the bridge is connected, more people are going to use it. Um, right now, it's it's pretty rough. I don't even use many parts of the trail. and I, If I got my mountain bike, I'd try it. But a lot of times, I'm on my road bike, and I'm not going to go on these unimproved parts of this trail. It's dangerous. So that's why your ridership is down, because it's not improved yet. Do we have an estimate of the uh, annual O&M costs for the Hawk system? Hmm. I, 
I you imagine know. it's all LED, it's, right? Right. So, and it's not on all the time. Yeah, you know, it's very so. rarely on. I mean, I, I would think it's relatively minor right. uh, because it's it's not like a traffic signal, and it's yeah. the LED bulbs last a long time. <clears> so <throat> I, I really think it would be a pretty minor thing. Any long-term maintenance for the uh, support posts and arms? Very little. We're, we're doing we're some repairs right? on the ones down in uh, Panad Square, but I don't know when those were originally installed. <laughs> just have a question on the parking area at the villa. What will prevent, because again, right now the ridership is down, most of that, those parking spaces you have on the north end, will probably north side of Mass Road, will probably be used during baseball games as they do now. What will prevent an individual from taking the 35 feet across to the fields versus the 200 plus feet to go to the crossing. If they want to cross safely, they'll use the, the crossing. I guess um, every individual has to make that decision for themselves, and we're designing for the people that want to cross safely, the, uh, especially the children and the families. You know, if I'm there with my kids for a baseball game, I'm going to take them by the hand and go across at the light. Yeah. Yeah. That parking, I think there's only, what, nine ten. spaces or something, ten spaces? Yeah. yeah I think about ten. The, the actual path, ten feet wide, would be very noticeable on the ground mm -hmm. as not approaching the pavement at, that, at the, the current you know, sharp angle. The, the actual path would be running parallel to the road to reach the safe crossing right. location. It looks like a rail fence as well. There's fencing proposed, right. Yeah. And certainly Goth, Gothstown could work closely with Gothstown Junior Baseball and education that you only cross in the crossings, just like they have signs on the streets to foul balls out into the street, use them, mm. only use the designated crossings. One of the reasons that were was taken into account on where that crossing is at the Villa Ball Fields was to avoid as much as possible total disruption of that informal gravel area you s currently see cars parked at. If the trail were to go straight through or, or some other uh, rail trail improvement stay on the original center line of the railroad, it would totally do away with that what is now informal gravel parking. And uh, what you do see is as gravel area, that is town property. <coughs> And then on the other, then towards the ball field, you have uh, 30 feet, a 30 feet corridor that's owned by public service. It's not until you actually reach the left field fence line that you reach the boundary line of the ball field. So this my point is that right now, a lot of cars can park in that informal gravel area, but if we were had a rail trail, uh, rail trail improvement go right down the middle of it, you'd do away with it. And you would, at some point in the future, it might be some consideration of improving that area, but it is town land. So if I understand it correctly, you're looking for a recommendation from this board to move forward with a Hawk system. Correct. And I think I'm hearing from board members, they're a little uncomfortable that the numbers aren't as solid or justified or substantiated than you'd like to see it? Am I getting a handle on this I, I properly? Don't have, I don't have a problem with the system. You don't have a problem? As, no, as DOT, DOT, it's, it's their road, and they're willing to pay for it. Well, I'm comfortable with the move on. I see no problems. <clears throat> All right, then, I guess, um, if you have anything further for us between, before we take action, I think we're prepared to do just that. So I think what we're looking for is a motion to proceed with a recommendation uh, as brought before us tonight. That is to proceed with the Hawk system. I'll make that motion, Mr. Chair, that we proceed with the recommendation uh, from the uh, Parks and Rec Commission, or Park, not the Rails Trail, Dave Pierce and uh, Kyle Quarum to move forward with the... Uh, and the uh, yep. consultant. Consultant to move forward with the... Uh, in conjunction with DOT's recommendation in their letter. Yep. I'll say. You should have just said it. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion <laughs> and a second. Do we have any further discussion on the motion? 
Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. I'll vote aye. So we have three ayes and two noes, so the motion carries. I think there's a second recommendation to accept the grant. We would need to be tech officially offered. Well, and that, that I actually tried to get some formal letter, and I used the word grant. Uh, what's also happened to us is our project manager retired about a month ago. So we have a new project manager. So he was digging in a file, and technically this isn't a grant. So I don't know how mechanically it works, mm -hmm. but what he told me is they're just going to pay for it. Um, so EHB is supposed to track everything separately, separately and break right. the design and construction costs of that. Mm -hmm. We haven't gotten it clear yet whether they're going to bill VOT or bill us, and VOT is going to pay us. I, I mechanically we got to figure that out, but it didn't sound. They're not thinking of it as a grant. It's when the like when the rail trail committee met met two weeks ago, that was our our knowledge at that time that there may have to be a consideration for the town to accept something in the form of a grant. I think they. The important point thing for this evening is your the board is aware that New Hampshire DOT uh, is going to step up to the plate for the funding, and uh, at some point we'll receive official notification about it, and then the board can react to that. So we'll have the details at that point. Do we know when? Do we have any idea when, how long that's going to take? I, I don't think this committee meets. Uh, I think it's like a monthly or a quarterly thing. Um, so at their next meeting, they'll probably finalize what exactly it is and I'll, I'll try now I have an email with other names on it so I can try to dig that out but uh, our project manager just was hesitant to call it a grant. Well, we'll need to take separate action then on the fiscal Yeah, impacts. if they're just paying the bill there's no need for public hearing to accept right. and expend um, mm -hmm. but if it is a grant <coughs> giving us the money and we're paying the bill right. then we'll have we'll to do the help. public hearing. If, if I can ask. I'm, I'm leading, reading through here, and I have nothing in here indicates any type of a grant. They just say HSIP, yeah. using HSIP funds. Right. What, right. What's HSIP? The, the only, yeah, I've never program, gotten the money, program. but it's, but my experience is they, they'll bring a whole bunch of people to your town, look at your pro problem intersection or whatever kind of floats to the top on their list, and then they just kind of make it go away. Um, like you want to do that with any other intersections we yeah. get? <laughs> <laughs> now that we know it's there. <laughs> but, you, Phil, you, you asked for the actual definition. It's Highway Safety Improvement Program. Right. Yes. And the second bullet after the suggestions, it says VHB should use separate bid item numbers for all construction associated with Hawk and their construction cost estimates and bid tabulation and final bid documents for tracking the construction cost to be applied to HSIP. Well, they're going to come back to us with all the financials. Right. That's yeah. my understanding. So, yeah. And there's no local match, is what you're saying. It's well, and it, you know, if you read that, there's it's, two. There's a little ambiguous. discrepancy. Yeah. Verbally, we've been told that you know, at one time it was a 90-10, and right. as a matter of fact, Director Wilhelm and I had some conversations about, okay, where are we going to come up with thirteen thousand dollars for the ten percent? But then verbally they came back said no, no we're gonna it's capped at one hundred thirty thousand but we're just gonna take care of it. So until we get something formal and in writing, um, it's kind of a little loose at the moment. Tonight all we did was authorize going forward with the Hawk mm -hmm. option. Uh, the rest of it will have to be taken under a separate motion at a later date. I assume date. that motion was contingent on receiving funding though. Yes. Right? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Mm -hmm. My okay. second was. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Anything else? No. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, something about signs. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> signs. Let's take up the uh, selectmen's discussion. Any new business items that the members of the board want to bring forward tonight? Nick, nothing? Phil? No? Alan? Nothing? Okay, how about a new business? No? Under last week, 
Spring Street was brought up. I received an email. Uh, the email basically says is he drives up when he can. However, sometimes uh, was potentially blocked. Sometimes uh, was potentially blocking the turnaround, so he backed up to avoid potentially having backed down. Um, I would point out that there is no legal opinion uh, or against the policy that the trash truck backing up Spring Street. The only restriction we have agreed to is that uh, the trash truck and recycle truck uh, after 10 a.m. So, I mean, depending on the day of the week it is, depending on the conditions, depending on, I guess, whatever, one day he's going to drive up, next day he could back up. There's no set pattern in his schedule. You know, and I'll point out that I think all of us are have to modify our driving habits based upon when the, tr when the pickups are happening and where they're happening. It's just part of our daily commuting. Okay, thanks. Um, anything else? Any little business anybody wants to bring up? Um, how about the reports? We've got reports from the library and CIP. I in here from last week. That was new, so. uh, uh, July 18th, library. Uh, we had the, <coughs> the library accepted uh, donations from New Hampshire Fisher Cats and they accepted some donations from the uh, Hannaford Supermarket. There was some discussion on their bank accounts. They want to do some different banking. I think they're looking into that. Uh, Quite a bit of discussion about the road up there, the, trying to change the intersection, but that kind of went away. It was a, it was a, it's a deep subject. I don't know how it's going to ever operate. Uh, yeah, the building uh, facilities uh, committee was. Uh, they met. <coughs> they go on and looked at the Baker Free Library and Bo, and they're going to go with the Laconia next, followed by Northfield. Uh, let me see. This one. Not much else was going on that board, and then I forget what time we adjourned. It was around 8 o'clock, I believe 8.30, I guess, was in there. And then we have CIP, and also that committee. Uh, sewer. Sewer project, they have urgent, um, it was to upgrade their capacities. Uh, that is at 2000, let me see, that's at 2014 out to 2019. And the user fees, a 20 or 30 year bond paid by the user fees. And we have, what else? We have the pump station, oh, Elm Street pump station, Force Main is going to be replaced. That was something that's very urgent for them. They're looking at that. Uh, actually, next year, as it appears here on the schedule. And that was pretty much all in a suit. And we've got, we have highway. I don't know if you people have uh, discussed it or heard of any of this yet, but we've got some, there's quite a bit of uh, discussion about equipment, but there's also quite a bit of discussion about bridges, and I'm sure we're going to see a lot more on that coming up. Uh, Henry Bridge, looking like that's going to have to be replaced soon, 2016 to 2020, somewhere in there. Uh, Couple of bridges on Black Brook. Henry Henry Bridge. Henry Bridge. The bridge itself, yes, has to be replaced. Um, what are we going to do with it? Are we going to do what we did the last time? Have the guys come in and put the explosives <laughs> on it and <laughs> drop it? I don't know. We're going to study what we're going to do. I think uh, it's going to be something different about the whole thing. It's quite a little not to remove the oysters. That's going on. The muscles, uh, I should say. No. Yeah. No, let's not get there. There's a lot of different things going on. Uh, most of the other bridges, though, some of the older bridges are in pretty good shape. Uh, the old, older the bridge, practice station bridge, uh, a lot of it was about the bridges and the roadways. <coughs> some talk about new equipment and whatnot, but I think some of that may have to take a back seat to some of these other things. So it looks like some of these other things are more pressing. They're going to be more pressing in the future. Well, we do have a lot of bridges. We do. And... There was some discussion going on that night. I don't know how that's going to come about. There's some discussion about new equipment, new trucks, replacements. But I'm sure that'll all come into play as the budget committee gets into that. It'll be an interesting thing to do, I'm sure. Always is. Yep. Always is. And that's what I have on that. Thank you. About conservation question. Yes. Conservation met last week. Um, Michael Allard, representing the Namaskey Lake Association, came um, requesting funding for uh, milfoil 
removal. Um, if you remember, we, there was a, a special article um, which appropriated $2,000 a year for five years uh, for, I believe it was for five years. No. Well, that was the proposal, but what went Oh, okay. So it was just, just one year, $2,000 um, for Glen Lake and Namaski Lake. Um, so the Conservation Commission uh, voted to release $1,000 to the Namaski Lake Association for removal and hold the other $1,000 for Glen Lake pending a meeting with Amy uh, Smagula mm -hmm. and residents from Glen Lake to determine when and if um, diving removal is going to take place um, at Glen Lake. <clears throat> if something cannot be done this year, then um, depending on the plan, they'd either hold it over for Glen Lake or authorize its release for Namaski Lake. Um, but Amy Smagula is going to meet with conservation next month. Um, they will be inviting any residents of Glen Lake. Also, Mike Allard from the Namaski Lake Association will be attending to tell whatever residents are, or explain to whatever residents are in attendance how the association was created, how they can start moving forward in the same manner uh, to to fight the milfoil in Glen Lake. Apparently, it's, it's very heavy at the, the boat launch area. Did, um, I'm trying to remember his name, the diver. Did he show up? He was invited, uh, Mr. Pilot? 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 Yeah. He, he, he was not in attendance. He was not, okay. No. I just want to make sure he understands, because this is the second time I've heard that it was a five-year project. That's mm. how it was introduced, what actually passed was one, one year, year, and then the following year, we put it into the conservation budget. Right. Right. Um, I just want to make sure he understands that there, he does not have an ongoing multi-year contract with us. It was one year. I'd hate to see him do diving and then find out that. Uh, the other thing that was brought yeah. up is that diving can only be done on the direction of the state. Right. And so there has to be a plan. Before. Right, because right. it's the disposal, end. too. Mm -hmm. And we're waiting for the updated plan on Glen Lake. Okay. We had received the updated one on Amaski. We also had a uh, presentation from Stephen and Denise Langley requesting a change in the conservation easement along maps 5, lots 56, 56 1, 56 5 on Tatro Drive. And um, the Conservation Commission will be doing a site walk um, as soon as they can schedule one to go out there and uh, take a look at the, the property. And that was the major. What exactly did they want to change the easement? Do you know? Yeah, there's a small, as you, as you go around the back where the new mm -hmm. medical building is, there's, <coughs> there's an older cul-de-sac, mm -hmm. yeah. and there is a 15 to 18 ledge foot there. ledge yeah. there. Um, the Langleys would like to put a small building there for their construction offices. The only access is to the right, as you're facing that cul-de-sac on the right side, but there's a small half acre conservation easement right there. Uh, so he's requesting that um, he get um, some relief from that conservation easement so he has access to that building. And he offered 40 acres in the back in return. I mean, that, that, and that's one of the reasons why conservation is going to do a site walk to see what the value of that conservation easement is currently and um, what they can work out. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, planning board. Planning board did meet, and there were three uh, major things. Uh, one was a uh, dormitory, uh, <coughs> St. A's, the new dormitory that was approved uh, for St. A's. Uh, the unique thing about St. A's is that the dormitories, uh, St. A's being college, is not zoned typically as colleges are zoned. So their dormitories are basically in the residential zone subject to zoning. Same regulations as residential zoning, so they need a, a conditional use uh, to put the uh, permit to allow you know, that size footprint and, and, and the dormitory. <coughs> so uh, that, was, uh, that was approved. Um, with a few uh, conditions that came in at last minute between um, sewer um, and some small things with uh, Megan for drainage and a couple of things with the fire department, but it appears that they may have been in there uh, 
already. Um, then there was a um, conditional use permit hearing site plan review for uh, to amend the uh, so, uh, uh, site plan for the Little Green Mall uh, to allow food uh, restaurant Chiggy's place uh, to go in there. Um, and the prior owner had done some improvements in there as long uh, uh, with the restrooms they were brought up to ADA compliance <coughs> uh, so there were two already two restrooms in there uh, there was discussion about the parking uh, and uh, they were approved uh, what that and another one that was interesting was there was a conceptual hearing for a proposed new small uh, an entrance change uh, to the front of Sully's um, basically, it's uh, a slight bump out. Uh, you know where the entrance it goes in. There's no vestibule in there, so in the winter time the doors open. You're right in there. In the summertime, when you open the heat and the air conditioning, so they're proposing right there. To, the only change on the property that was discussed, uh, the conceptual, was that that was going to be pushed out a little bit, and on a 45 degree angle, they're going to add a vestibule and to the right side on the street side and the opposite side towards the parking side they were going to bump out a little bit not the whole length of a building but for small section they were going to bump those out just a little bit uh, there were three handicap spaces on the outside that aren't don't comply they 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 they're undersized to begin with those would be realigned and they would be too compliant spaces you know with the with the appropriate distance between the two of them and the uh, and the signage uh, for it and um, the planning board uh, uncanceled their uh, traditional no meeting at the last of August to accommodate uh, to accommodate the uh, uh, you know they suggested that they didn't it, it for what they're doing, the fact that the, the that business has been there before zoning, that they really didn't need to do a full-blown uh, site plan uh, for what they were doing, uh, that the board felt that uh, they could probably uh, waive the formal site plan for, uh, for that change. Thank you. Will they still meet ADA compliance in terms of the number of ADA parking spots? Or, well, th th that's, that's, I guess there's some discussion on that too because of uh, the size of the spaces, where they are, and part of the difficulty and part of the reasoning uh, for some of of rather than getting into the site plan is there's several lots. Uh, the that that there are several lots that it sits that that it sits on. I believe it was three lots that uh, that encompassed that. So it would be kind of you know where the where the spaces are is kind of hard to calculate. But if they're going to eliminate handicapped spaces, any new ones would have to comply. So there must be a minimum so number on their site plan and how many they have to have. Well, they don't have a site plan. They never had one. They have 51 to 75 spots, and they have to have three ADA spaces. How many? Three ADA spaces if they, they have, have 51 to 75 parking spaces. I think they have 49. 49? Then if they only have I 50. believe mm -hmm. that number was 49. Okay. So maybe that's where the two came yeah, from. Yeah, where it is. Yep. But the thing of it is, is you're, you're making, even though you're going to two spaces, you're improving it because they're undersized to begin with. Right. So it will be the inaccessible, I assume. That's what I meant. It has a space. Yeah. That's that space that's in between the two. Right now you have three little tiny spaces. Yeah. So what action did the um, planning board take on this? No, there was no action because it was conceptual. Oh, but okay. they uh, uncanceled the meeting uh, when the understanding that the applicant would come in uh, with a with it with, and requesting a, a site a waiver of the site plan, but not the public hearing because the notices have to go out. 
they was talk about possibly doing it at the next meeting, but I brought up the fact that it's August and pushing something through like that, uh, the perception of that, I didn't think was, uh, was a good thing to do. And they agreed, so that's when they uncanceled the following meeting, <coughs> the last meeting in August. Okay, thank you. Um, we do have a non-public we need to deal with tonight, so is there any other business come before the board before we go into non-public so that... Oh, yes. just follow up on my report, and I apologize. Yep. Uh, in the discussion earlier in the planning board prior to this, uh, on the agenda, Brian had uh, Southern New Hampshire planning dues, and he had action... I forgot exactly, but action, action required or something to that, so there was a slight discussion about that, about the dues and uh, who approves the dues, and I said it's Board of Selectmen, and uh, one comment was made that, well, maybe this year we should uh, consider not, uh, not paying the dues. I'm just, okay. I'm just, <laughs> okay. I'm just yep. passing the information on that in case somebody comes here. I didn't want you to be blindsided. Get, like, get caught off guard. Nick, did you have something? Well, I was just going to ask. We have a request for um, call firefighter hirings, and if there were no issues, is that something we can just act on without going into non-public for? Right. So why not? Make a motion. Well, I, I would make a motion to accept the fire chief's recommendation to offer a conditional offer of employment for two call firefighters. I'll second it. A motion and a second to accept the recommendation. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0-0. Zero, zero. Um, I believe we still need to go into non-public for yep. land and real estate, right? Correct. Right. Oh, so right. anything else come before the board so folks on GTV know that when we come back we won't be taking up any new additional <coughs> uh, items. Um, so if you want to do. You're welcome to do it. <laughs> we'll sign off now. Good evening. Thanks, y'all. Motion to go into non-public.